Welcome Spartans to the latest Podcast Evolve book club. I'm your host today, David, and I am joined with Aaron. Hi guys. And Krista. I read a book. Yay! Yay for us book readers. Today we are talking about, if you haven't guessed by the title, Moral Dictata, which is the third and final book in the Kilo 5 trilogy. Boo! I don't want it to be over. Yeah, but it's it's good that it's over in a way that it's a nice self-contained story. It ends in a nice way where it's satisfying. It leaves a bunch of stuff open and a bunch of stuff kind of ready. And um, different threads that get picked up by other authors and stuff like that. Because I think Karen has a hard out of the Halo-verse. She did her three books and that was kind of it. But it's good to see that these characters are still getting kind of picked up elsewhere. But we'll talk about that later. Krista Brown, do you want to take me through the stats? Sure. The title of the book that we are reading is Mortal Dictata. The author is Karen Travis. The publisher is Tor Books. Formats available are print, audiobook, and ebook. The release date was January 21st, 2014. That was a long time ago. Jeez, it really was. <laughs> it was a very long time ago. The length of the book is 496 pages. So this wow. is quite a long Halo book. That's a fact. A whopper. I was just listening to the most recent podcast of all issue or episode that I wasn't on. So I was finding it quite hilarious that Aaron was describing his ginormous version of a ginormous book. <laughs> oh, yes. I forgot to get a photograph of that for people so they believe me. Yeah. So, like, is it just like one of those larger text size for people who can't read good so they I think can it read must it be, Yeah, It must be like a large font size for, like, per eyesight, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's majestic. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I ended up with this giant book because it's so much bigger than everything else. That's pretty cool. I I have the paperback with little tiny print, but even at that, it is a solid book. You know, and it feels it. It's pretty good in terms of like what it covers and where it starts, and like you know, oh my god, where where it starts. Yes, uh, <laughs> man, I opened this book. You read the first. Is it the the first chapter? Yeah. You read the first chapter and you're like, oh, it's going to be this kind of book. Yeah, it really takes it like, okay, the first two, the last two books we kind of ha- have already covered. So I'm assuming you've read that those book clubs or listened to those book clubs before you've gotten here. So you've got a good idea of what you're getting yourself into. They're quite serious books. They touch on some of the topics in the Hale universe that tend to get glossed over. Kind of like the cloning, the child soldiers, the kind of like really the hard things that Halo does. The Kilo 5 trilogy has been really good for that. This book starts it in real hard with getting a look. that It really drives home the horror of what was actually done. And it's kind of, it's like nothing else. Like the first cup opening sequence of this book is just like, it's the one of the hardest things I've read in the Halo universe. Yeah. In terms down. of like all their media, like it's just, okay, we'll, 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 we'll kind of get into Let's it. Let's go into it. Let's go into it. I won't bother reading kind of this summary because you kind of know where it's going. This book is timeline. It starts off uh, way before. So it kind of opens with a sequence about, I'm going to say Stefan, but what do you say? Uh, Stefan, they pronounce Stafan. it in the audio book. So Stefan Sanansky, which is Sinsky. Naomi's father. Sinsky. Naomi's father. It kind of opens up where it's their life before Naomi was taken, like just before she was taken by Oni. And it kind of sets the scene of their life on the on their planet which i'm blanking on what it's called sansar sansar yep yep and uh, so they're actually from uh, sansar which is the new atlantic province in alstad which is her childhood home it sets up the stefan stefan and his wife who i'm blanking on her name she's only in this chapter so she's, she's only in a small kind of se- section so it's kind of like together which seems quite nice i liked the, the kind of the way they describe this six-year-old girl and how like stefan is like so impressed with her he's building um a dollhouse for her because they're kind of and i'm sure this is like the world over for my my dad did this this is if you know they can't afford the thing so he's like i'm going to build her the thing she wants and surprise her for the down the line isn't this the thing where he hasn't built it she's building tiny dollhouse furniture she's building the house furniture yeah he's not building the house yet that's later oh did he not build a house no it's for his granddaughter oh okay i'm getting sorry get blurred get blurred 
Uh, I thought he was had, had started to build a house, but he was talking about it. He knew that she wanted a doll's house and had noticed that she was building furniture because she was obviously saving, maybe herself, her savings to get the house. She saw it in a store window and was immediately captivated. He talks about how at like six, she's building this really high quality furniture. Detailed furniture. And he himself is kind of like an engineer. I forget what his trade is, but he's a bit of everything. He works at a factory. Yeah. So like he's using like cutoffs and stuff. Or whatever. You're getting kind of muddled between the two stories. My fault. Sorry. So anyway, they kind of, they build up Naomi as the child, almost you, as you can see, the child prodigy kind of coming to the fore where as six she's very mature highly intelligent was in and he said like how unusual that was that she was so enamored with a doll's house but that wasn't the type of child she was but then he had the idea and i think it's explained later in the book when he's kind of having flashbacks that what he presumed she would like the most about it was a tiny world and a tiny universe and a kind of the way it's kind of scaled down but it has maintains a high level of detail so she found that fascinating and was also fascinated with the stars and stuff, which is important kind of later. So Naomi's not here. She's on the bus home from school, which is kind of like crazy when you think about because the father and mother have like an, an argument here about like, or at least he kind of flashes back to the argument of letting her go that she was so mature that she wanted to go. She wanted to be left by herself. So it was kind of a deal where like she could get on the bus from school and come straight home and then she could do that journey by herself and she was allowed to do that and it was kind of a big deal and he was so proud of his daughter being like that mature and that clever and then i'm pretty sure the books it starts on the day she goes right they're they're literally waiting for her to come home and he has a present for her because it's her birthday yeah so he had gone and bought like a planetarium a planet yeah, isn't it yeah it's, like, it's a planetarium light like a hollow projector i think from the sounds of it it, it sounds uh, more physical because it has a globe it has like a globe shape because uh, he talks about how it's wrapped. It's like one of those night lights, but it yeah. shows the star, the, the sky of Sansar. Yeah, it is like a future night light where it sounds like it can do different constellations and hemispheres and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's based on this world, but it sounds kind of cool. But it's a night light because apparently she still gets scared of the dark is what he said. It's a lovely idea. He also talks about how he was taking extra shifts to pay for it and stuff like that. Yeah, it really builds up the character of this man who is so important in this book. And you're kind of touched upon the who he is and you get kind of chapters of him in the previous books. But it really sells home that like as he is the quote unquote bad guy that he's not a bad guy. It's one of the most well motivated characters you've ever had in Halo oh, is yeah. the father of this. And it's like total side tangent. But I'd love the story of him like a side story of what he happened does after because it sounds like he had quite a crazy dark time in between the the two segments where we where the segment ends and where it picks up because that'd be kind of cool where he goes around trying to find answers essentially and to see that kind of slow build and his character change and um, because you get to see the quite sharp ends of where he is now as a father to, like a quote-unquote normie to where he becomes the leader of a terrorist cell well and also like he he talks about uh what remo andrew remo exactly who he met in that period and that uh, he teaches him how to kind of be who he is, like a survivor and um, kind of like a rebel. Do you know what I mean? Like he doesn't really play by the rules anymore. He builds his own rules. He's like a massive organized crime leader. Like he's not even, he's not even kind of a rebel guy. He's like mafia boss. By rebel, I just mean in, not like insurrectionist rebel, but like a rebel in terms of against the establishment. Do you know what I mean? That he doesn't really play by the, the rules anymore or that he's making his own. He's kind of... He's also Arthur's Arthur 079's dad, yeah. Just in case wondering who that is, he's a character who died in the package, so he was a Spartan too who died um, when they were trying to retrieve Captain Haldry, where we had Sexy Halsey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Halo Legends, which is kind of canon. I just watched that the other day. Actually, it's weird. How do you like Sexy Halsey? She's all right. I'm a little sad that they made a very cool Spartan with Solomon and then killed him almost immediately. Yep. Kind of a bummer. Back on track. Naomi doesn't show up. She's delayed. And it's all from the perspective of the parents getting, the, as you can imagine, the worst news of, like, your daughter's missing. The very real thing. And how it's portrayed here is just so It's hard. haunting. It's deep, man. You can see this happening. I mean, it happens, unfortunately, every day in the real world. You know, children do go missing. Seeing it told from the parents' perspective... Where they're kind of, they're lashing out at each other, they're blaming each other. 
the mother takes it very harshly, as you can imagine. The father is like, stay home. They're getting... Because she hasn't come back in a certain enough time, the cops aren't kind of very responsive. So you get the incense and of the community comes together to kind of help find this girl, try and search for her. Search parties are called. It's horrible, as you can imagine. He drives along the bus route. He's trying to imagine what she could have done, why she would have got off the bus early. It turns out that she did get off the bus early, but he wasn't sure why. They had camera footage you know I mean, of her getting off the bus to stop early. That maybe she had done that to kind of walk the rest of the way home and all this kind of... And it's just kind of it kind of builds it's the story chaos. in the spiral yeah it's chaos as like you would imagine it would be there is some kind of significant beats here where you can see the tension between the relationship well she like the wife looks at him and says if she's gone i'm never gonna forgive you oh yeah totally because she 100 percent is blaming him for like allowing her to go home i can see that that's real like it's a real response do you know I mean i could totally believe parents have like you know relationships would split over the loss of a child you know yeah when when there's blame and stuff like that you know what I mean it's god it's hard and then it's like eight hours later yeah there's a solid chunk of time later and she's found and she's in the hospital so the mother gets the call and she calls Stefan well they found her just sitting on a at a bus stop yeah they found her sitting at the uh, was it yeah it wasn't that bus stop it was way away it, like it was in a different place where she had no it's like a different to city or something it's I think it's across the town like it's on a it's on a different bus route yeah, it's on the wrong side of town. She appears kind of disheveled and kind of um, very confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but she's she's in the hospital. So Stefan she goes to the hospital and meets her, and straight away his alarm bells is going off or something is off. The mother is just thrilled to have her daughter back, and the doctor is pretty much saying, you know, if there's nothing done to her, she's kind of physically fine. She's a little bit um kind of not out of sorts. You can kind of see that she's not like remembering things kind of correctly. She she says she doesn't remember anything that happened. And we, as the reader, know exactly what's happened. And that what we have here now is the Flash clone that's just been placed. Oh, the worst thing she says is, like, the doctors come in and she's like, there are usually more doctors than this. And you're just like, oh my god. Yeah. And, and Stefan's like, what the fuck? Yeah, because this is, like, the first proper interaction we've really had with a clone at this stage. Other than, like, the Halo Legends stories. You've stuff seen them in seen. Halo Legends, but, like, you get this sad look at this sad clone. Well, and here. the clone's not six years old. The clone's probably, like, weeks? just a year old, weeks old, yeah. And they had to teach this clone, you know, how to talk, how to walk, how to... I don't know exactly how it works, but they do have to brief them on who their parents are, what their likes are, what their dislikes are. Well, obviously, whatever way they do it, they also must play with their memory where they have no memory of them not of being a clone. Do you know what I mean? Clearly, they don't know what they are. They believe they are who they're told to be. They're probably highly suggestible. Yeah, they were probably just raised in a hospital room like she woke up in. Totally. And then there is a flashback scene that comes back here where Naomi as an adult is has her memory kind of jigged to come back. And that's really dark. And, and crazy but I don't want to talk about it do you want to just... wait to the reunion for that we'll wait to the reunion because there's more that happens but essentially Stefan never really believes that this is his daughter he says like she doesn't know who she is she doesn't behave in the same way she doesn't have the same spark in her eye she doesn't have the same things and the big thing is that she doesn't remember the dollhouse so that was the big flag for him she also couldn't remember any of the constellations when he gave her her present yeah so she has um essentially like he gives her the present anyway when they bring her home from the hospital and put her to bed, saying, Oh, no school for you or whatever, you take a school for the home and he gives her her present and she's no real she's like, Oh, it's pretty, but she's no real concept of what it is and doesn't recognise anything. Stefan is like, Nope, something's gone wrong, this is not my daughter. The wife completely believes as well. Of course she does. Yeah. Do we want to talk about kind of the cause we get it like drip fed to us between the story, but do we just want to talk about the gap between this moment and the moment we kind of find Stefan in. Yeah. I think, yeah, we should just to keep it together. Yeah. So after this, you know, Stefan believing that this isn't his child still gives the child the best life he can because she's a clone. She's going to die very, very. He doesn't know that she's going to. When they find out, he makes her comfortable and makes her believe that she's loved for the rest of her life. The wife pretty much immediately commits suicide. He leaves Sansar soon after Sansar is actually glassed by the Covenant. And then he meets up with Andrew Ramo, who's the father of Arthur that we talked about earlier, another Spartan. And then they kind he kind of teaches Stefan all he knows. Uh, Andrew Ramo dies for some... We don't really know why or when. 
I thought, did it say cancer or an illness or something? It was an, It was something like that. I'll look it up there quickly and see what I can find. Remo dies and then Stefan kind of finds his way to um, Venezia and kind of builds an empire there. And at this point, he's still just trying to build enough, trying to get answers. He's like at the end of his life. He has a family now. He thought he didn't, like he kind of thought he was just going crazy till he meets uh, Remo. Oh, and yeah. then they compare notes and they realize, oh shit. And then I think he says Remo uses his like clout with people in City Hall and pays them off to get police records and they manage to trace like a handful of other cases that match yeah. their own. So now he's realized he, he doesn't know the extent of it and he doesn't know why, but he knows something happened. And they also don't know that these they never say a clone or anything, but like he's now He's at this stage where he has enough of a suspicion to, like, want answers from Earth. It just says later he died knowing that Danny's gate would continue his search and information what really happened to his son. So there's no mention of, like, how he dies. But he is pretty much labelled as an insurrectionist, so the two of them become colonial rebels, essentially, is what it says. Cut to modern day? Yeah, it's kind of the very sharp. And it was that was a hard first chapter, like, you know what I mean, to read. It really sets the mood for this entire book, though. It is like, wow. <laughs> in terms of Halo, I think this is the first time in any of the Halo stories, because this is pre-Hunt the Truth. Like, this is the first time where I've ever stopped and went, oh, this is all a bit fucked up. Like, this is... Because when <laughs> yeah. you see it, you see it from his perspective, and you're just like, this is awful. Like, th- th- they're so traumatized. They're so hurt. And then his marriage falls apart because the clone has this degenerative disease and his wife refuses to have any more kids because she's convinced they're carriers, even though there's no history of it. And then she kills herself in the bath. And then he just, like, packs up his life and floats he off just from leaves, planet yeah. to planet. Yeah. And it's that coupled with the cover of the book, which is just a child looking down on a helmet which is obviously Naomi in her kind of right dress as she's described and looking down on her like Spartan 2 helmet. While we're on this topic do we want to talk about what the title of the book actually means? Yeah because I kind of had forgotten but it is in the trivia so I'm gonna I'll call it out there if you want so the name of the novel is is a reference to the UN colonial mortal dictata which is mentioned in the book a few times. The piece of legislation associated with the ethics of medical science. Catherine Halsey broke the dictata on several occasions, namely when Flash County humans. The novel further elaborates on the specifics of the dictata, which had previously been mentioned in passing by Halsey's journal. One of the chapters actually spells it out in kind of, um... It's actually, like, the document, so it's like, one, you'll never harm humans, two, you'll never take anyone without their consent and do surgeries without their consent, no human will ever be Flash cloned, just, it's just, it's literally the Spartan program, like, kind of line oh, by line. Oh, 100%. And it is like, you read that and it's... Oh, I have it here, Oh right. my god, okay. Uh, one a 3 so... A human being shall be defined as a person recognized and accepted by a reasonable lay person as being human on the basis of form, behavior, and external appearance, and no authority shall be permitted to use any element of genetic profile to exclude a person from that definition. A human being shall not be restricted, selected, or subjugated to discrimination on the basis of their genome or genetic profile, whether altered or unaltered. A human being shall not be brought into existence with the intent of providing biological material or research data for the use, treatment, or benefit of another. A human being shall not be subject to any commercial claim, patient, patent, or restriction on the basis of any part of the genome or genetic profile, whether altered or unaltered. A human being, regardless of any engineering of their genome or introduction of the non-human or artificial DNA, shall not cease to be classified as human under any circumstances. No human shall be the subjected to genetic alteration except with their express and informed consent or in the case of a person under the age of 18 with the consent of their legal guardian for the sole purpose of correcting a health defect in that child. A human being or part thereof may not be owned by an individual or organization. A human being shall not be cloned. So as all fans of Halo, all the red flags should be flagging in your brain right there when I read those out because you can see several of them. All of them being pretty much broken in order to make the Spartan 2 program. Which does have some ramifications later on in this book, which I liked that they brought in. But that's pretty hardcore. Totally makes sense that the book is called this, and the two main characters of the book are the father and daughter, who are majorly impacted by this. It's like, this novel is almost like written like a poem. It's it's just a perfect kind of uh, 
reunion story. Kind yeah, of. reunion story and amalgamation of everything that's happened, everything that's been touched on in the Halo universe just regarding the Spartan program and the kids and stuff. There's an interesting topic that's kind of broached later on in terms of retirement, which I liked that they brought in and kind of discussed because it gets you thinking about it. So, sorry, so where are we going to go? So, the chapter two Venezia. takes us back to Venezia. So, we have Vaz and Mal who are undercover. Uh, in the bar. No, Naomi's undercover at this point. I don't think she's she been brought she back. hasn't been pulled. I thought she was brought back. I thought it was the two guys. No, no, because she sees her father. It cut like at the end of the last book, she sees her father, and then I don't think she's recalled until this chapter. Sorry, I think you're right because she has to get brought somewhere else since we have a different kind of thing. They recall in the last book to go and extract Phillips. I think that's what happened. She was there first. She was there first, saw her father, and I'm pretty sure didn't she like stake out the house for a little bit? Was that with Faz? No, that happened in this stuff? book. That right, that is because she goes. Yeah, she goes with down and like has a beer and stalks her dad. Yeah, essentially, she goes to the house and kind of realizes that he has a family outside of her, and then that's kind of where she kind of discovers that. And then she gets recalled. <laughs> then real fast, she gets pulled out because this story has a lot of side stories happening as well. And they're all kind of interesting in their own right. You probably won't be able to touch on everything. Side story. No, I won't. But um, there's a Kigar one, which I actually enjoyed. So oh, that one's kind of Oh, I don't like the Kigar one. Oh, you don't? I have a love-hate relationship with it just because it's Clovan, right? Uh, Cholvan, they call her in the Cholvan. audiobook. She's really interesting, but she breaks up like what you actually want to read. Like all of the side stories yeah, take yeah, you yeah. out of the main story, which is what you're really here for. Which I have a little bit of a problem with, but her story is really cool. Literally, literally, it's she wants to she wants to make the kid Yar strong by getting uh getting the ship, which is now called Naomi, <laughs> pious inquisitor. Uh, she wants to get the ship because she wants to kind of make a, um, united Kigyar government so that they aren't subject to, you know, what they were in the Covenant because they were a lesser race. She wants to show that they're a big race. So she's just kind of stuck in the middle of this war between the UNSC and Staffan. So she's just kind of there. I like that idea, though. I like seeing a Kigyar different than its kind of stereotype, and that's kind of what I liked about Atriox because he was so different to the brute stereotype. And you have the Arbiter, who's very different to the elite stereotype. And I liked those characters do that, and I was kind of hoping they were going to build a Kigar, which is a race I really like, and especially like how they interact with humans, that they're so easily interactable, which is a great thing of why I like Venezia yeah. uh, as like an idea. Now, I know there's brutes here. There isn't elites yet. I think some of the older books actually do place elites on, elites on, elites on Venezia. At this point, the elites are too busy. Yeah, yeah. They they haven't really crawled out of their own kind of civil war yet. Where are we going? So, anyway, the guys are still on reconnaissance on Venezia. They're st- they're integrating themselves with the help of Mike, who uh, Mike Spencer, who's a really kind of cool only agent. I like him. He pops up every now and again in kind of different stories as well. So, he has the two guys, Mal and Vaz, who are kind of now integrated as deserters. They're UNSC deserters. They're UNSC deserters. UNSC deserters. They're very quickly picked up by um, a character's name I can't remember, but he's like head of the kind of militia. Gareth? Gareth, is that his name? Uh, Gareth is the arms dealer. I think him and... uh, Peter? It's him and Peter and Andrew, I think, basically. Gareth, I want to say, is the one. Gareth is the one that puts their name forward to Andrew and Staffan about pious inquisitor because they need someone that has experience with uh well i think he puts their name he puts their name forward first because they want someone to train like militia soldiers and do what johnson did in contact harvest and then they're like oh do you know how to work covenant ships and they're like oh yeah like we we work all of it we're brilliant they're like bb please help us and tell us how to work a covenant ship yep it's kind of cool so like bb isn't there yet they kind of get picked up pretty quick, get brought in, get kind of tested around. They try out some weapons. The guys are pretty impressed because they're pretty much acting as themselves right now. They're just ODSTs, essentially. Obviously, their name is um, carrying weight and they're kind of getting brought in pretty quick to get kind of money to get their kind of first kind of wage and stuff like that. So they're quite delighted with that. And I thought it was a cool comment that Spencer makes that like, I'm here years or six months and I'm barely in. You guys will show up and within a week you're in, you're on the inside. <laughs> yep. Which is pretty cool. And it's around this time that Stefan kind of has is sealing the deal with um Sav Fell, 
who contacts him and lets him know that he has Pius Inquisitor and it's ready for sale. So they kind of hash out the deal. Does that happen here? Yeah, it's here. This is Telcam's ship. They've stolen it. Yep. Which is kind of cool because that's... So Telcam is one of the major characters in the previous books. He's barely in this one. He kind of just shows up kind of on the call. He's just very angry. (laughs) Yeah, he's just an angry elite trying to get his ship back. Well, he was stupid enough to trust the jackals with it. He gets all that he deserves. Yeah, it's true. true. Without it, we wouldn't have this book so or any of this trilogy because it's kind of based around getting this ship um, because this is a big ship, essentially, with a ventral beam that allows ships to be, or this allows you to glass, essentially. So that's why everybody wants it. The UNSC want to stop anyone from having it. The terrorists want it. And KGR want it. And so do the elites. They want it back. And obviously this ship has passed through numerous hands, which is mentioned that the brutes had it at a time and stuff like that. So everybody wants the data and stuff like that that's on it. So that's a goal. I think they said at one stage it was at Earth during like Halo 3 in the Great Schism. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's kind of cropped up again. I think it was involved in glassing parts of Earth. I think that's what they mentioned. Where are we going to go? Stefan essentially gets brought up to the ship. He gets kind of shown the kind of what it is when it's like, obviously um, Safel has like a skeleton crew kind of running it. They... Slip space to another uh, planet. I think it's Shaps 3 or something. I have it in my head. Something like that. Something like that. Some remote moon. And essentially they're going to test the ventral beam. So they kind of blow it up. And then they kind of shoot while well, he shoots it off. And kind of destroys some forerunner runes. And then a crazy sound happens. And then Safel kind of unveils that he has like a bonus prize. Which is a Hurigok called Sinks. Sometimes Sinks. Sometimes Sinks. And he's very angry. <laughs> He was a very angry and eccentric. He's very broken. Yeah, which is very interesting. And his little story is kind of cool as well. I'm waiting for this guy to crop up again. Because he's like a very unique character for the Hurgok in that he doesn't behave the way they normally do. He's very loyal. He's very loyal. So essentially, Stefan realizes that like, oh man, he's freaking out. And that because of the destroyed forerunner attack. So he kind of makes a deal that they will shoot the beam again. He wants to shoot it himself, but uh, he makes a deal with the Hurgok. You show me where I should fire this to do no damage. So the Hurgok immediately falls in love with him and um, they have a lovely, happy story. It's like one man and his super intelligent dog. Yeah. Yeah. So I loved how he described it. So Stefan's here with his son, which I should more Edwin, who's a kind of very cool character. I like that the two of these guys are kind of like, a play like um well and edwin doesn't believe his story at all yeah that's kind of important thing that edwin doesn't believe stefan's story of he's very open but naomi and stefan is very like put out by this because he thinks his family now thinks that he's crazy so he doesn't really like that he's obviously he started a new family new wife he's got a son he's got a granddaughter so like he's obviously very invested um in his new family well not entirely he has a just something cool i thought they mentioned at one stage he has a daughter that he's not close to because yeah like he can't bring himself to like form an emotional attachment with another daughter who's never really mentioned at all i think they mentioned her cooking at one stage she makes like a oh that's her i thought it was edwin's wife for some reason no i think that's his daughter uh Uh, what's her name hedda and she's like big into her scandinavian thing and makes this rotten fish and they're all joking about like how gross it is yeah that's cool he he just mentions that he could never get close to her again which is sad. It is. Okay, so there's a cool moment where what's going through Stefan's mind when he's kind of imagining what the elites were doing and what they would say, would they pray over this, would they kind of make it a holy kind of thing to the amount of destruction that when you push this button is you're very removed from the pushing the button and have it causing massive destruction at the other end. So he, he it's interesting to hear his thoughts and how he rationalizes that in terms of putting himself in the elite's place and how it just makes him angry and kind of disgusts him. And Edwin's kind of the same. He kind of picks up on that. So I love that kind of interaction on the bridge here. I thought it was really cool. Essentially, Stefan is, yeah, okay, this is good. Let's seal the deal. They kind of do their negotiations on the price, which I can't really remember in terms of money. It's like a but couple dropships and Yeah, stuff. it's a lot of dropships and small arms and stuff like that. Stuff that Safel can actually use and sell like he normally would, which is what Venezia does, it's kind of small arms. And obviously Stefan has a great stock, so he's kind of giving him as much as he can, within reason. There's a bit of back and forward, uh, Sinks is thrown in the mix, and essentially Sav obviously agrees, and the exchange is done. Uh, I don't think we get to see too much after this in terms of like, Stefan kind of has a bond with Sinks, which is kind of important, because later on he kind of uses Sinks in terms of he keeps him on the ship, 
gives him a kind of plan of what the guys are going to do. So obviously he doesn't trust anybody. So the Kigar crew goes off the ship. Stefan leaves the Hurgot behind sinks with a kind of the plan of what they're going to do. He's going to communicate with the ship every eight hours, giving us like a safety message. Sinks is going to stay in the ship and repair what he can and can kind of get it up and running. Obviously, it's a massive ship, so it's going to need a bit of work and a bit of kind of um, improvement to allow kind of humans to use it. So Sinx is also given a set of coordinates and told what to do in case anyone tries to board the ship. He's told to slip space, jump the ship to a predefined coordinates if any should anyone try and get in. That's kind of important because as you imagine, that comes into play later on in the story because everybody wants this ship that now Stefan has. So it kind of cuts a little bit then. Um, you don't know but what I just said there, but that happens later on, but it's kind of important. The ship just kind of sits in the coordinates, essentially, for the bulk of the story. Stefan goes back to his, back to Venezia. He calls over his friend, who's like the other, I don't think get the impression he's a politician, but he is someone who is high up in power and invested in Venezia's kind of well-being and running in the way that it kind of self-governs itself. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he's only really in this sequence of Peter, you're thinking of? Hey, yes, it is Peter. Peter Moitz Smarts is Stefan's friend. So he kind of pretty much out and out tell to have over a drink on his porch. You can imagine two old men sitting out on a porch having a drink, discussing the fact that, yeah, he has a crazy ventral beam ship and he's renamed it Naomi, which is important uh, and kind of sad. And his plan is to use this ship now that he has enough weight behind him that he can. It's kind of a loose plan, let's say, and clearly would never work, but he's a driven man and he's going to use this ship as a big deterrent as well as a, I'm going to point this at Sydney, at Oni, at UNSC and say, I want answers. Where's my daughter? Tell me what happened. And that's essentially all he wants to do. And that when he's done, he said, he's, as Edwin says, this is too big for him. Um, He's going to slash donate or give the ship to Venezia to use it as a deterrent. Uh, should anyone including the UNSC show up and try to take over again or meddle in their affairs oh god there's a lot of talking here guys a lot going on <laughs> there is the story like we said has side stories side characters and kind of jump so I'm probably going to jump around a little bit here because we obviously won't be able to cover everything so we kind of mentioned we will kind of cover the sick kick yard now because I know only mean kind of Chris to care so <laughs> Telcam obviously his ship has been robbed he's furious he doesn't really know what to do he's trying to find it so his idea is the only way to get his ship back from pirates is to hire more pirates. Yeah, he's kind of dumb. He's kind of dumb. He under I think someone else advises him to do this, and I can't remember who. But anyway, he eventually puts out a tender. He wants Kigar to find his ship, and he'll pay them for it to retrieve it back or any information. So then we're introduced to this Shoal character, who is a female. Um, she's kind of a badass, actually, a female uh, Kigar shipmaster. She has a ship called Paragon. Has she shown up before? This isn't her first story, right? We've known this character before. I don't think so. No? I think this is her first. I think we had... Did we have a female... Did we have a shipmistress one time before? That could be what I'm getting mixed up. Child Vaughn. Yeah, no, so it's her it's first appearance. Yeah, so she has a whole kick air crew. She has her own ship. And she has... She's had, She also has a family. So I thought that was really interesting to see kind of family side of she has kids how she's treating them and training them how she's taking on board things her interactions with the humans have kind of influenced how she views herself and her race which is so fascinating and how she was doesn't want to be a bunch of dirty pirates in it. do you know what i mean she had she knew that once upon a time kick air were a great space fearing race who didn't uh, agree to anybody they just kind of fought themselves they were kind of free and she wants that again she wants her race her people to be free and to be proud of themselves which is quite a a good goal so i like i've liked this character for this she wants to essentially build a ship or a fleet and have kigar together so when this job comes up she's like hell yeah i'm taking this and i'm not going to give the ship back she's just going to take it and use it to build her fleet because the kigar would never be allowed to have this otherwise the story very quickly goes through her getting her crew together getting hiring people tracking down different in the inf- from the information she has she tracks down what a member of Savfeld's crew figures out that yeah they've already been paid the ship's been sold kind of beats it out of him of who he was who he worked for went to Savfeld figured out he was on Venezia gets himself 
gets herself from where she was like a space station where Kikara was stripping down. That was kind of cool, talking about how the Kikara are slowly breaking down the Covenant kind of installations uh, from the inside out. So that was kind of cool. I, I kind of like that. And then um, they go from there to Venezia, pretty much walk straight up to Sabfeld's house as he's packing and just kind of grab him, kidnap him. Oh, that's way later, though. I know. This is why I'm just doing all this side, this crazy little side story together because there isn't really that much important, but I'll stop when we get to the ship. So essentially, Jovel, she kind of beats her way slash bribes Savfell to the coordinates of the Pious Inquisitor slash Naomi and then takes her ship off to go get it. And there I'll leave because there's loads more in the middle that kind of happens before we get to the ship. Because several stories join together at the ship, as you can imagine, near the end of the book. Whew, okay, now we don't need to talk about them and anymore. Will we go back to the Marines? I mean, they they meet Stefan. They meet Stefan because now he has the ship and he ha- just recently, very conveniently, has these two Marines who know Covenant technology have just shown up. So he's like, oh, excellent. I'll get these guys and get them to have a look at the ship and see what they know. So the guys are kind of like going, holy crap, this is great. Uh, we're in. They go up to Pious Inquisitor with Stefan. This is a crazy scene because it's just like, oh, it's it's happening now, huh? You want to take it there, Krista? I just need a break to talk. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> The, p- the plan was to get a fragment of BB and just plug him into the ship so that he could take control of everything. But unfortunately, Stefan's just like, no, we're leaving right now. Because they're like, can we go like, I don't know, get get some, st- change clothes, They you get know, like anything? super caught short-footed. And it's like, oh, this would have been really good if we had have like been prepared for this because we expected this to take weeks and now we're here. Oh, shit. Pretty much. So what happens basically is... Uh, Mal and Vaz end up on the ship. They kind of they figure out the coordinates, don't they? Yeah, they steal the coordinates off the console. They like have the tour around, and then Stefan's like, "Right, we'll we'll like we'll organize some stuff." And then he takes them back with him again. Oh, by the way, they drop in their awesome Hurricane handling skills on top of everything else. Like they really do a suspicious job of overselling themselves as being experts. I think at so everything. too. Yeah. If I was sitting listening to them, I would just be so suspicious, being like, how the fuck do you know all of this? And I think the book does do a good job of, like, them being self-aware enough to know that we've just oversold ourselves. That clearly these two guys are not good spies, and the book, they do say that several times, that the guys are not trained. As only operatives, though, they're not trained for deep cover, undercover work. No. They, I don't think they make a balls, but I think it's just it's too much happens too fast. And obviously alarm bells are going off when you have a smart person like Stefan, who's so well trained. Yeah, they're just a little too good to be true. At uh, Yeah. Well, Osmond's freaking out at this point because they haven't called in for a while. Because as you can imagine, it takes a really long time to travel to Pius Inquisitor because they have a really raunchy, like, beaten up uh, ship that doesn't have a very good slip space drive. So it takes an hour or two or a few hours, don't they? That they go through. They miss like two Collins, though. And Osmond's like, where the f are they? I think it's like 24 hours or something their way because he says to them, like, do we need a change of clothes? And Stefan's like, we'll not be gone that long. But like in this time, they've disappeared. And then they reappear and they're like, we were there. We had it. We saw the ship. So they make this plan. They're going to send BB in on the transmission because they figure out that Stefan's like sending a, a check signal to Sinks. Every eight hours. I love this bit because BB's so prepared. He's like, I'm just going to pop in the carrier wave. I'm going to go to the ship. And then he gets to the ship and it's like smack, no no access. And he's like, motherfucker. And by the time he realizes what's going on, he's back again. He's like, I couldn't get in there. He's like, the engineer stopped me. And he's really disgusted that the engineer stepped in and prevented him from getting on the ship. And then, of course, immediately the engineer tells Stefan, and now Stefan's, like, in a frenzy trying to figure out who sent the signal. And that somebody's trying to get to his ship, so now he's thinking Savfell has sold information of where the ship is, so he's like, crap, I gotta move the ship. So he's kind of getting a crew ready to do that. Well, Savfell's been kidnapped, too, so Savfell's That's gone. right, Stefan goes to his house and figures out that, like, he goes to confront Savfell, and his wife has gone crazy. Important character in later books, I like her. She's like, where the hell is my my mate all you people are useless you can't find them she goes off on stefan who kind of re- retorts with like so i don't have him someone else has tell me what you know he was roughed up and taken so he figures out that somebody has taken him for whatever reason 
So he he knows he needs to move the ship essentially. That well, it's been... I think Sinks already moved it, so he's like trying to figure out what his plan is, and then Sinks didn't move it because Charles Vaughn shows up where the coordinates that Savell gives her. Oh, that's right. He moves it later. Yeah, he hasn't moved it yet. Is it Gareth the arms dealer when when Staffan's at like their military base and they're talking about who might do this, and uh, Gareth says like, "What happened to their like?" pasty blonde friend that looked like Stefan. Stefan, yeah. And everyone turns around going like, the what now? Oh shit, yeah. And that's like what sets Stefan off. Stuff happens so fast after this point, by the way. Yeah, the book really takes off now because it's obviously a slow build of intelligence gathering and counterintelligence. Like, and it's like not not relevant stuff that kind of happens in between here. It's all stuff that you can kind of like be, oh yeah, it's, it builds up to this point. And this is only about like halfway through the book that this happens too. Now I'm going to interject is you're probably wondering, well, where's one of the main characters? Where is Phyllis is very, very little to be seen in this book. He's pretty much always on the Port Stanley, listening to communications and various translating uh osman obviously never really leaves the ship she's in charge so she's in here touching base and there's sequences back and forth between her and bb and conversations uh happening uh, naomi is actually gone with dev who is the pilot of the odst pilot devro and they're going to go pick up another uh drop ship because port stanley has requested Bug another drop ship bug off so they're traveling with the two hergok that they have um leaks and quick to adjust i think isn't it i think so yeah so they're traveling to another state place that we know and i'm totally blanking on where they go they head to uh, they head to an anchor station it's like it's an anchor station it's like anchor five or is anchor five the one in reach it's maybe a different one you see yeah that's what i was thinking i that's where it's flagging but anyway they go there they pick up their second ship they have like some small downtime in terms of like they go pick up some mail and stuff like that I think and some packages and I want to say stuff like that anyway they get their second ship they hurgock the crap out of it so they re-ramp their second ship and they get a whole fleet of new upgrades like a slip space drive camo all sorts of kind of crazy awesomeness cool holographic table comm center as well as the ability to communicate in slip space then they take these ships and fly them straight back because they get pretty much told, I, I want to say, are they in a bar or a shop or some? They're out somewhere. Vaz and Mal are in their, like, yeah, their new local pub. Not Vaz and Mal, but, like, the two, the girls, essentially, they no, get they're just told on the immediately. Station. They're on the station, but, like, when the guys get picked up at the bar and Stefan kidnaps them, and um, BB is with them and immediately bugs out, tells Mike to get out that they've been made. So Mike grabs his stuff and does a legger. And then the two girls are on the space station get told immediately, you need to come back. Yeah, I think they're in like the mail center. They're collecting post for uh, Osman. Things that they've requested, like um, I think there was like the ginger and stuff like that that she takes for slip space to kind of ease her stomach and stuff. Stuff from Paranowski kind of sends, sends them things. So they pick up their wreck, their various equipment and run double time, take their two uh, ships and slip space themselves back to Venezia. Um, so that's where they're they're coming in. While that's happening and they're traveling, the guys have been kidnapped by Stefan and he's pretty much torturing them. He's beating the shit out of them. So this is another scene I think we spent some time on because this is another really dark scene in Halo where you get to see the bad side of it in terms of the bad side of humanity in the story. You get these two characters we love, Faz and Mal, who are like separated they are very different ways of what they're going about doing. So Mal is obviously the one in charge. He's more level-headed. Vaz is very much um, morally he's, conflicted. He's biting people. Yeah. So it's like, well, no, it's, uh, the other character, Mal is biting Vaz. Vaz is very oh. morally, because like, Vaz is the one who wants to talk to Stefan, who hates only, who hates like you know, what they did. And is very, he feels the guilt Vaz, of that. He's yeah, he empathizes with Stefan completely. Like, he's just like, we, we did bad shit. We are in the wrong here and someone should put this right. Yeah, so Mal and Vaz had an argument and got pretty heated over what they were going to do about this. And essentially, Vaz, in the process of getting brutally tortured, lets out that he knows more than he does and he wants to talk to Stefan. So that kind of puts the halt on his um his beating because they were drinking beer and stuff like that, he kind of pisses himself. So they kind of mentioned look, the state that, that he's in is pretty bad. 
when then it kind of cuts to Mal, who is also getting a beating, but is not taking it as well. <laughs> Let's say maybe Vaz is. Yeah, he, he thinks he's about to get a power drill to the back of the neck to remove his thing, so he bites one of his captors. Brutally mutilates him. Yeah, and they talk, the thing that they talk about in it, and you're like, I never actually thought of that, was how tiring it is to tear a chunk of flesh out of a person's arm. How he's talking about is, how his yeah. jaw gets sore, and he's just biting down and biting down and biting down and hoping they don't kick him in the jaw and break. He's like growling and stuff too. The person's like, oh my god, what the hell is going on? Narn, it's Narn or Nurn or Narn. There's, there's a character like that, and that's who he is. He's the guy who kind of recruited them. He's the one... He recruited the guys and he's viciously beating Mal, who turns around and bites him and brutally kind of mutilates him, which is awesome. It's a great scene of just like the ODSTs being badasses, essentially. I think it's around this time as Steph- Stefan comes in with a gun and pretty much takes the guy out. Well, Maz and Va- Mal and Vaz are reunited. Did that happen first? See, I can't remember which. I think he meets Mal first, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. No, he, he, star- he talks to Vaz and then meets with Mal, and then they're put in a room together, and then they're separated again. Faz pretty much tells him certain details that he shouldn't know. Like cloning. Yeah, and it totally triggers and pushes all of Stefan's buttons. Stefan's son freaks out and is like, is totally believing that he's just using this information that he's guessed to like get himself out and to manipulate Stefan. Stefan gets really angry at his son, kicks him out, and pretty much takes Vaz and moves him to another location. Because he wants to quiz in himself, um, essentially. So Faz kind of tells him a bunch of stuff and kind of lets him know that his daughter is alive. Yeah, he. I think isn't this the stage where he says to him, "I I know your daughter." Yeah. He doesn't tell him much, but he's like, "I know your daughter. She's alive." He still tells them tells them too much, all things considered. Yeah, he says she saved my ass a couple times, stuff like that. Yeah, he hasn't dropped the bomb yet about like what she is or anything, but he's done enough to keep them alive and then he's in this like outhouse building and then the rescue comes because i think isn't it uh it's mal mal gets rescued first he's in the cell and he's talking away and he's like i hear or was it does he do like i spy, I spy or with my little eye something that starts with s he has a second guard that i love he starts playing mind games with so he starts messing with the guard. Because he's, uh, he's fucking afraid of Gamal. He's just like, oh my god, this guy just... The second guard is like a, a, an experienced guy because he's like, I'm going to try and figure this out. And the other guard like has him up against the wall and ties his hands right and stuff. And he's like, clean that damn blood off. You look like a vampire. And he's like, mm, this guy's going to be slightly more work than the other guy. Yeah. And then Naomi comes in. Yeah. Okay, so the guys have been coming back with their drop ships, and they pretty much straight away come down and intercept. They must meet Port Stanley first because they only come down with one ship. They come down with both, I think. Do they not? Do they? I don't know. Because they do both extractions at the same time. So, like, I think Naomi. Do they? Comes out. She comes out of her drop ship and goes like through the roof of the prison block and gets Mal. Yeah, she hard extracts Mal. Um, so I like that you could just Spartan in full in full kind of full spartan mode essentially busting through the roof of the cell killing the guard and just pulls mal straight out and kind of jumps out the hole she just made which is pretty cool back onto her drop ship and away and then dev is going in the other kind of building that um it's kind of a it's not a holding cell it's like a server room i think something like that yeah because stefan says it's kgr proof so you can't tell on under it and all that and no signals can get out, kind of, essentially. But um, we know that they know where Vaz is anyway. Devro pretty much blows up the door and gets through. Vaz has already pretty much spilled his guts, essentially, to to Stefan. So Devro comes in and Vaz makes a big attempt to, like, save Stefan, make sure he's not, like, hurt in the kind of the rescue attempt. And then, like, immediately kind of grabs him and takes him. So he comes back on the dropship, which is obviously a big deal. And the two ships kind of lift off and... and get out of Venezia and meet back up with Port Stanley. This is when the shit starts happening. Yeah, story happens fast. So obviously this is a big deal where Naomi's on one dropship, her father's on the other, the boat heading towards Port Stanley. Osmond Heineck has to come into play now and dedically balance what's going on. Who knows what and what information is where. She kind of coordinates with Phillips then to get Mal and Vaz to the doctor. Kind of their suite to kind of get them looked over, but immediately she has to kind of take custody of Stefan and put him away somewhere before Naomi gets it. Naomi shows up, so there's a bit of kind of play with the characters here. 
Uh, I thought the conversation between Stefan and Osman was cool. It was really kind of great because you have this super high up Oni official who is pretty much next in line to be the most powerful person in the galaxy almost talking with a really low level. I, he is an insurrectionist terrorist even though he hasn't really done anything. He's just kind of a masked arms sold him and obviously he has a plan but he hasn't actually done anything bad yet which they do mention several times which I, I appreciate. Just to remind you of the bad guy in this book isn't really the bad guy, you know? Yeah. They do a great turn and said we're mal and stuff and people realise you know only are the bad guys in the story. Do you know what I mean? They're the ones that have done wrong and they're very much going against these people without their knowledge. Osman has this little moment where she's talking to, I can't remember if she's thinking to herself or talking to Baby, and she's like, Christ, do I have to like take credit for only sins whenever I was yeah. one of the people sinned against? She's like, they fucked me over too, but I have to stand here and take staff and shit for it. Yeah, it's one of the great kind of reasons of why she's such a great character, and to put her in a place that powerful, given the fact that one of the worst things they ever did, that organisation, was to her. Yeah. And now she's in charge. So that's fascinating and a great kind of juxtaposition. That's why everyone loves Sarah and she's great in this trilogy. She's great in other books she shows up in. We definitely want more of her. She, she's well deserved as like a, a main character in this story and the, the universe. This is getting very exciting. You know, this sequence of what, where, what's happening in the Port Stanley is very, very exciting. So you have Stefan, Naomi, you've got Faz and Mal. You have these relationships kind of breaking down that people are, you know, Mal and Vaz are kind of very angry with each other. There's a lot of them. Um, but we kind of forgot to mention how Stefan kind of breaks Mal a little bit is the fact that all Mal cares, all Vaz cares about, sorry, is Mal and his well-being. So he kind of trades off where like, I'll tell you what you want if you let Mal go. So he kind of knows his weakness. So the two ODSTs are, are like very heavily entwined with each other. There's very much the sense of like brothers in arms that they're very, even at their worst, where it's just like where are they're at odds of what they're going to do with the knowledge of Naomi and, and Stefan. That once it's out and done, they kind of get over it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's done very well. Vaz obviously thinks, you know, he's drew a court martial now of what he's kind of done. But Saren kind of takes it very well and obviously treats it very differently than Paranofsky would do, which is kind of interesting to see how Oni will operate, let's say, maybe different now. Stefan is kind of put in kind of a holding cell by Osman and they have a brief exchange, which is quite cool. And then Naomi is brought on. And then very quickly the story is, okay, we have to get to Pious Inquisitor because they know that there's an eight-hour signal being bumped and that they can't get in and that there is a ship out there with a Hurgok on it that will do something they don't know. They, I don't think they know about Savvela Trevon yet looking for this ship, but they know they're on a timer that they need to find it. And then it's just getting Stefan to give the coordinates, which Osman kind of breaks a deal with him that... He will give the coordinates if he lets Naomi kind of choose what she wants to do next. That's where the, the negotiations here are pretty kind of cool in terms of what's happening. Saren very much takes Stefan onto the bridge and pretty much tells him everything more or less about the Spartan 2 program that Naomi was a part of it. That was a wonderful moment, especially as you see his kind of horror shock and then his rage. And it's at Saren who immediately snaps back and she's taking it on and holy shit, I was one of those children. And then tells him that. I love how that just fucking that kills him dead. Because like, what do you do in that situation where you hate the kind of organization, but the person in front of you representing them was one of those children who yeah. has been greatly wronged. That's such a great moment. It's a amazing concept it's one of the reasons i totally love this book that it does things like this that sets these characters like this with each other to this wonderful interaction so you have the crew pretty much just sitting there eating popcorn do you know what i mean like eating this shit up because this is drama like space drama baby pretty much osmond kind of asked bb to call in naomi if she wants to come and meet her father she should come down onto the bridge that essentially is what happens um so you get a crazy crazy reunion between Naomi and Stefan, which is awesome. You, you have to read it. it. It's something you really have to read to really appreciate. It's something that hasn't happened in Halo lore yet and has only really happened here where we have the resolution of a decades-long horror story of children being kidnapped and, do you know what I mean? Okay, um, Stefan immediately asks about Remo. Andrew Remo, he's my buddy. We had a kid. Where is his kid now? Is he here? Is he alive? And then you immediately know he's in. dead. Yeah. BB chimes in and lets you know that that's Arthur. BB's being, everyone sort of slowly notices that BB's very, he's not his usual self. He's very prim and proper and respectful. 
he's I think he keeps calling uh, Staffan Sir all the time. Yeah. He harkens back to reintegrating his damage fragment as being a huge moment in his life that changed him and made him realize his mortality, I guess, in terms of he becomes way more human and way more like humanized in terms of like he has friends and treats humans as friends and sees himself as like a person that interacts with other people and has relationships and like that's one that's one of the great reasons why BB is such an amazing character in terms of how he interacts with his crew and gets on so well with Phillips and stuff like that and that's one that's been built up so well in the previous two books and he's always talking about now how he changed and how he deals with um, Naomi and a kind of awesome moment is coming up again so anyway you have all these people on the bridge Naomi is trying to give her father something like trying to remember trying to like connect to what She's now 40? Yeah, she's in her 40s. Yeah, they're all like their early 40s. We're talking 35, 36 years ago. Like, you know what I mean? Trying to remember these things. She remembers kind of parts of Reach and stuff like that, but not a whole lot about her family. There's mentions and stuff in the dollhouse that becomes important. She remembers that's what she wanted. So Stefan is breaking up here. You know what I mean? Like, he's, he's in bits. So he's trying to tell her, trying to connect to her. He... She's had such a different life. Yeah, and he's just trying to understand you know, what happened to her, what she is. Immediately his kind of thing is, I'll give you the coordinates if you give me Naomi. He doesn't really understand what a Spartan, but it means to be a Spartan for a Spartan. You know, he just knows what was kind of, not even the bad parts that were done to them, but some of the things. So, is it now they kind of split and break? Stefan and Nomi kind of go off and do their own thing, while Osman... Osmond and Mal figure out the coordinates and just head there anyway. <laughs> yeah. This is the stage, I think, uh, Sinx tries to get a hold of Staffan and he eventually decides they're lying to him, so he cuts off communication. I thought that was great. They take Staffan's radio, Sinx comes to talk on it, and Sinx is freaking out because the KGR have shown up and are starting to kind of cut into the ship and they're kind of breaking in. So he needs to talk to Stefan to kind of get touch, to touch base with it. So he's kind of, um, he's dealing with it. So like there's a whole story of what's happening on the Pious Inquisitor slash Naomi where he's kind of shutting down power and trapping the Kigiar on the ship and stuff like that. So he's jamming their comms and all this kind of stuff. He moves the ship and then Staffan realizes he has a card to play. He doesn't do that yet because the guys are kind of trying to bluff their way through and say, oh no, you remember us things. We met you when we helped, we told Stefan how to feed you and stuff. We're friends. So then he doesn't believe them. Yeah, that's how that call ends. He's like, I don't believe you. I'm going to have to see the Reclaimer. He moves the ship and then Staffan's like, I have a card to play now because I'm the only one that knows where the ship went. So then that's how he plays his card to do the next bit where he's like, I'll take you to where the ship is. But, you know, you have to take me on board to see Sinks. So they send, is it him and him and Vaz? They send. Yeah, it's him and Vaz. Because he's like, I need a pilot, Sinks, because I'm not very good at this. And then they send Naomi and Mal the other way out onto the hull and they're going to break in through an access hatch because they decide Sinx isn't an AI so he can't be in two places at once so he'll have to make a decision whether he's going to be with Mal and Vaz or, or with uh, Staffan and Vaz or if he's going to go after Naomi and that. But what, what's important is that Osman and Stefan come to an agreement of, what of what's happening. Before they go on this mission Stefan says, right, your my agreement is that you let Naomi go if she wants to. And Naomi then has to go and think about what she actually wants and if that's possible. And Saren kind of they kind of mull it through in terms of what's it like for like a Spartan to retire. They mention here that only one has ever done it before. And that's Randall. Randall. And I want to say it's Randall, but his name isn't mentioned here. And so I find that interesting that they had a they just said that one person did this, but that's it. And we know later that it was Randall. But that happened, like, that's Halo Nightfall. That happened many years after this. Well, Randall was retired for a long time before that, I think. Did we know about that at all? I thought that character only got created for Nightfall. I think Randall existed as a character, but they didn't have a... I don't think he was specifically this Spartan. I think there was a Spartan Randall. He's, like, mentioned in... Could be Evolutions. It, I think it is... I think Randall is the Spartan that the deformed one knocks out in Evolutions. That's where he came from. Mm, okay. Soren. Soren. Soren takes out one of the, like, train Spartan 2s, knocks him out and escapes. And I think that's Randall. And then they've taken that and this and put Randall together. 
but that's okay. where he features first. That's cool. But anyway, they kind of talk about the fact that Spartans can retire under very special circumstances, but Osmond kind of makes it her mission in her brain that, like, she will allow this to happen. It, she'll make it happen. Do you know what I mean? If Naomi wants to go, she won't keep her against her will. They'll make some kind of agreement. Then Naomi has to think about what's her life going to be outside of the Spartan program. And that's not a life that she really wants. But what happens anyway is that Naomi decides to read her own file and to also have BB in her brain chip in fully uh, in inside her essentially and to help access areas of her memory that she can't remember. So you get this awesome sequence of BB pulling data from everywhere, files from Reach, files from Oni and stuff like that. Files on her capture and what kind of happened and piece it all together to kind of help her remember while being kind of inside her brain. So kind of playing out memories and stuff like that and kind of help her trigger her memories. So you get a whole bunch of different stuff with here, which is kind of so cool. So you get her come back to what happened when Naomi was captured, and why it took so long, why there's such a time difference. She was kind of distracted and led off the path. I can't remember how they did it, but somebody, they, she was distracted and when she was moved and then someone grabbed her in like the bushes and trees. And when they were kidnapping her, they had kind of obviously injected her with a sedative. They had to be careful when doing it as to not to kill the children. Or obviously they wanted to give them enough to knock them out. She was put in the back of a van and stripped. They wanted to give her clothes onto the clone, essentially. So she woke up when they were doing this. So she woke up in a van full of strangers being stripped naked, which is horrendous. Yeah. Because of her nature, that the car that she immediately fights, her father had told her what to do in certain situations. Should she ever have this? So she had this in her brain of like, get out, get away, and make loads of noise. So she pretty much bites and fights her way out of this sh- out of this van. Yeah, she throws herself out and like lands in a ditch, and then she like she just runs. She books it. Yeah, but knows to kind of keep quiet because there's no one around her to really see, hear her other than the people trying to get her. So she kind of very cleverly kind of goes like, kind of like a river and kind of tries to hide and kind of hide her scent. But obviously the only team, I don't know how long she got away for, but longer than they obviously thought. She's out, I think for a couple of hours, it takes them to track her down because she's like hiding in the ditches and stuff till she goes numb. She's slowly kind of working her way back towards home. She knows if she follows the river, it'll lead her to a certain place, which will lead her to somewhere she knows. So she's kind of trying to do that. But obviously the only team kind of recapture her. They have like thermal vision and stuff. So they kind of capture her back and knock her out again, essentially. Replace her with the clone. That kind of traumatic memory kind of like helps solidify her character and who she is herself. Obviously a fighter and very much like her father and takes after him in certain ways, which is kind of cool. Then it kind of triggers back a bunch of memories on Reach on what she was like in the first days. And very specifically where Halsey told her that her father wasn't coming for her. Her Uh. father knew where she was and thought it was totally okay. And believed that she was supposed to be here, that she was a special one. And that breaks this child whose whose sole belief was that her father would come and get her no matter what. So that kind of event obviously sets up the... Oh my God, fuck Halsey, I hate her. And obviously why she was so angry at her father without really kind of realizing it. Yeah. She believed that her father knew where she was and didn't care. Or that knew, thought that that was the be- best way to do it. I can't think if there's anything else that comes out of her memory trip. Not really. I think that's the majority of it. So that's an awesome moment, as you can imagine. We don't get many stories about Spartans doing this, going back so far, but Spartans that care, really. I think many of them have moved on. Um, in terms of, and I'm obviously specifically talking about Spartan 2s here, because each generation of Spartans have the addition, a different kind of intro. Funny, while well, you say this, I'm re-listening to, I think it's the Flood as a book. It might oh. be the Flood, or maybe it was Reach as a book, uh, the audiobook, but they were talking about John. He's asleep, I think it's in the Flood, and he's having a dream, and he's having a dream about this woman that he thinks is his mother, but every time he tries to grasp her face, she first turns into Halsey and then she turns into Cortana and then he wakes up. So like they, they've kind of touched on it, but like on his own, even he can't remember his own mother. That's very similar to the um, trailer for Halo 4, where it's John on the beach and then a woman like saying, John, John is Cortana. It like flickers back and forth. So they, they like touch on it that like the Spartans are just... They they have a name for it, some sort of like childhood amnesia where they learn so much at such a young age that they forgot almost everything they originally knew. 
And this is why they have such trouble trying to remember anything about their families. Which was deliberate, obviously, to indoctrinate them at such a young age so that they could get these Spartan soldiers that would believe as hard as the Spartan 2s do. Then, essentially, Naomi, now with this knowledge of kind of who she was as a kid and where she wants to be now, kind of kind of reaffirms, especially because of the mission that they go on kind of next in terms of this is what it means to be a Spartan and I am a Spartan, regardless of how I started and what my original motivations were. Like the way Halsey made them believe that they're the saviors of humanity. They are the best of the best. They actually are the best of the best in terms of even they kind of when they unveil what the Spartan program is, Stefan, that like she really was one in a billion in a trillion. You know, these children that were selected for Spartan 2s were special people anyway. Do you know what I mean? They would be am- they were going to be amazing people anyway. Don't they talk about how Halsey mentions in her diary that they could have been the next day? Uh... They touch back to Halsey's journal a lot in this story every now and again in terms of obviously these characters have access to Halsey's journal and they interpret it very differently in terms of like, okay, we outside of the Halo universe read Halsey's journal and love it. Yeah. I err on the side of obviously I'm a Halsey biased. So I err on the side of I believe what she's written and that she believes what she has written. That she is inherently maybe not a bad person, but this book obviously shows you the horrendous things that were done and were allowed to be done all because of Halsey and the other main characters in it. And I think, is it along here, oh, there was just one thing I wanted to say that there were, is it Staffan's talking about or is it Osman about how Halsey wrote in the diary that the you know these Spartan 2s could have been like the next Alexander the Great or uh, yeah. Yeah. whoever and then I think it might be Osman, she's like, it's like, fuck me, baby. Why would you take the next Alexander the Great and train him to be a foot soldier? You know, wouldn't you kidnap yes. them and make them the next line of admirals in the UNSC? And that's such an excellent line in terms of taking apart Halsey's argument in terms of like when she's justifying what she did in terms of like, okay, in some cases, these children were actually saved by coming into the Spartan 2 program. For example... Naomi's planet was glassed. She would never have made it off it as a child. Do you know what I mean? So there's the that element. And then later on, yeah. Saren opens her own file and you learn, okay, she was also saved and had a very different story to Naomi. So there is some good to come from the bad. Um, I think we all know that as Halo lore lovers. We know the Spartan 2s. We know their horrible origins. But ultimately, what they are is somewhat worth it, maybe? Question mark. That's horrible. Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. So Naomi is kind of pretty much kind of sure now that she wants to stay with the Spartan program. That when she's not alone in terms of having a family because she has her family on this ship and what she feels for her team is very strong. Which is important because Stefan and Vaz have a kind of bond and they kind of build on that very quickly here. Where okay, they're now going to a Pirates Inquisitor. They have the coordinates. They have an agreement with Stefan on what they're going to do take back this ship and Stefan's gonna just go away retire not bother with them being only not bother sorry with being an insurrectionist which um very much comes from the fact that now he's gotten the answers he wanted even if it's not satisfied in terms of he's he probably got more than he expected in actually getting his daughter and getting to talk to her where all he really wanted he believed that maybe something horrible had happened to her and they just were covering it up which kind of is true it's kind of what they were doing so where we're going next now is we're at the ship. The kid gear are, are on it. They are fighting their way through and cutting through doors. And they're making life difficult for Sinks, who's trying to also make life difficult for them. But they've made their way onto the bridge and they're kind of fighting their way through the ship, essentially. So um, they make the plan, like you guys said, where Naomi is going to cut in with Mal on one side and Vaz is taking Stefan through on the other side where Sinks is letting them in to the um, through the oh what am I the hangar essentially so they've taken one drop ship and gone through and the other guys are taking their um do they go EVA yeah they go EVA and come in through I think an access hatch yeah you want to talk talk through this I'm gonna get a drink Darren yeah that's it Staffan and Vaz are in the bay and they're trying to like talk things out with Sinks and he's chatting away with them and then Naomi and Mal breach through an access hatch which shortly after they get into the ship Sinks goes along and removes the hatch so they no longer have a way out and then while Sinks is kind of running around doing a few things Faz takes his chance and sticks BB into the computer. Mm -hmm, Yep 
Sinks has a big freak out and he shoots off and they have this like long thing about BB describing how he's like falling into the core and all the lovely data and then he suddenly has this moment where he realizes Sinks can't purge him from the system so he just isolates him and starts to bypass all the critical systems and BB's like oh the little motherfucker. He starts to cut power to things he starts like ripping cords from the wall. He cuts cables and he bypasses them, so he like bypasses the engines that BB can't control them and does all this. And then he cuts the communications for everyone, so Mal and Staffan can't talk to Naomi and Vaz. But then BB realises he can kind of act like the middleman, so BB can talk and broadcast over the entire ship. So he's like giving clues to Naomi and Mal as they're going along, giving them little like whistles and clues and telling them things. Yeah, so the guys are killing the key guards as they meet them as well. So they're kind of clearing the rooms. And then he try, they try to negotiate with Chul Vaughn to get her off the ship. And she's determined not to go. And she ends up, while she's talking over the broadcast system, she gives clues to some of her crew about like blowing up, I think they detonate torpedoes. Yeah, they set torpedoes to be to detonate inside the Sets ship. the reactor to go critical. So they're now on like this 15 minute countdown to escape. So... I think, isn't it, Naomi? They're on the bridge. Sinks opens a door for Ch- uh, Chulvon to get out, and then Naomi and Mal burst through the other door, but then Chul takes her chance and she escapes. Now it's just a run to get off the ship. Yeah, so they're getting off the ship, but the other doors are damaged, so Naomi and Mal can't get... To, I think it's Faz and Staffan are on one side of the bridge doors. Naomi and... Mal are on the other, but they can't get through the bridge to the hangar bay. So Naomi and Mal have to backtrack through the ship to try and get out the other side because Sinx has told them that I removed the hatch so there's no way out the way you come in. And then when they get back to the hangar bay, Vaz takes the Pelican and Staffan takes a spirit drop ship that was there. And then he goes outside, but he won't leave. So he's waiting to make sure that Naomi gets off the ship while they're like... I think Naomi's booking it through the ship and Mal's having a tough time keeping up. He's like exhausted at this stage as they run. Devereaux is going to pick them up from the far hangar bay. And then while this is happening, Faz has a sudden change of heart and he gets Baby to pull parts of Naomi's file. I think it's the letter that talks about her kidnapping and the it basically just the information to prove to Staffan that he was correct, that yeah. gives him proof for his family. And the cloning and yeah, stuff. He like tells that. BB to give him that stuff, and then BB pops over to Staffan and talks to him, and he has this like quite emotional thing where he's talking to Staffan. It's amazing. BB's conversation here is so good, and it, it like it made me really emotional listening to it in the book. And he's in among all this, he's like, "Oh, Sinks has been busy." He's like, "We did the same thing to our pelicans," and this like this is the moment then where you realize that there's a chance Staffan can still make it out. Because the spirit normally would be too slow to escape the explosion, but because he has a slip space drive in it now, he can make it away. Staffan believes that if he goes back with Oni, he'll just be imprisoned and sent away to a dark room. So that's why he's never his option is not to actually go back to Port Stanley, it's escape. Well, it's not even I like how BB phrases it like Well, if a certain Hergok were to put a slip space drive, then you would have a way out, but Oni would follow you forever, but let's just say you slip space really close to the explosion. No one would be able to know that you died. We wouldn't be able to find a body, and you could live on your merry way, and... Yeah, he's like, if you promised to stay out of Earth's way, then nothing would ever have to happen again, and everything would be good. And he gives... I think he gives Staffan a secret code. His code, yeah. To, like, be able to send to information. Yeah. So he gives him this and then he's like, I'm just going to go on now and I'm going to delete everything. But, you know, I'm really sorry for everything you've been through. He says, if you if you want to talk to your daughter or send anything to your daughter, use this within the next seven years. Yeah. And because then after that, I expire and he's like, I'm going to delete this information and I'm truly sorry about everything, sir. And Staffan's like, why would you be sorry? But BB's gone by then. And this is all hinting at backstory to BB that we get at the very end. Oh my god, we're not going to talk about that yet because I can't deal with it right now. In the end, Mal and Vaz escape just in the nick of time. They're basically, they're running out through the hangar bay door into Zero-G, almost on the ramp. 
And then Stefan is on the other side. He sees Naomi shoot out and he's like, okay. And Think then he suddenly realizes see. that Sinks won't, dis- Sinks won't leave. So he goes and negotiates with Sink to get him. And he's like, come on, Sinks, you, you come with me. I look after you. And then we don't know if he slips bases out. They leave it at that, that the ship explodes. And we get it, I think, from Osman's view that that's a ship boom. And the last Vaz knew was he was trying to get Sinks to board the Spirit. And they don't know anything yeah. else until, I think, later. So then, as you can imagine, the story kind of is over, right? Because the objective of this book essentially was to get this Pious Inquisitor out of everybody's hands and either capture for humanity or not. So while this kind of happens, which we should mention, when, v- when BB was put in, he immediately got all the data and downloaded it and beamed it out to Port Stanley. So it's, it's a win, essentially, because it gets all the data that was in the ship's computers. You they only now have it. And the ship has now been destroyed, so the Kigar elites, the insurrection, no one has it. So it's pretty much a win. Paranofsky is kind of in here a little bit. She has kind of been in this book a little bit in terms of interacting with Saren and BB and had some very kind of interesting conversations. And with these characters where she's obviously winding down in her position, because Saren is getting promoted. So actually, that's one thing. Saren gets promoted some way in the story of this book to like a different, to, to like pretty much the second in command position. She was admiral in the last book. But isn't this one where they have cake for her and stuff? No, that was in the no, last. No, that was book. the previous book. She she's an yeah. admiral at this stage. So like she's right. As soon as Parangoski dies, she becomes head of Oni. That's all she's waiting on. Right, right. So anyway, there you're in the kind of the debrief kind of segment of the of the book of the story. So the main objectives have been met. Yay, happy ending, kind of. The team believe that uh, Stefan is dead, so they're kind of miserable. So eventually, I'm not really sure about the timelines. They probably do tell you, but I can't remember. Faz gets some post. Uh, it's an unusual shape. It's kind of addressed to him, and it has an unusual address of how it made it to him, but only are really clever, so they got it to him anyway in whatever address it was given when he opened it it was like not really for him but it had a message saying i keep my promises if Vaz immediately realizes it he's like oh shit so Stefan and Vaz kind of made their own little kind of promise where Stefan realized he oh no me wasn't going to leave he realized what she was and what she was doing that it was important that she believed in it and that he was happy enough with that but he wanted he pretty much said Vaz you you care for her and Vaz pretty much says yeah and he says but you promise me you'll look after her and Vaz pretty much says like always you know they kind of promise each other and then Vaz kind of asks him when you get out of here you stop being a terrorist you know what I mean did you just let it go you just retire yeah you go you collect your family you live your life yeah and that's pretty much it Vaz realizes that this gift isn't really for him it's unusually wrapped he's not really sure what it is it doesn't really have the correct adapter because it's powered, um, which I kind of love. So then he runs to Naomi. No, he gets goes. He gets a, a Hurgok. Does he get the Hurgok first? Yeah, he gets the Hurgok first because he's afraid to take it out of his uh, room and he's afraid to r- call over the radio. So he goes outside into the hall and calls, gets him up. He modifies it and then he like goes off to find Naomi. He's like yeah. really the Hurgok's super excited for this too. He's like, "Oh, this is old. It's so cool." He's like, yes, I've never seen one of these plugs before. This is great. And then changes it. And he's like all pleased with himself. It's very cute. Yeah, he's learned something new and he's happy. Naomi immediately plugs it in and recognizes what it is. It's the planetarium that Stefan had. It was her original birthday present. He eventually got it to her. Doesn't he? Isn't there a tiny chair in it as well? Uh, I think there's a tiny, is there, there's a tiny chair in the straw with a note. And then there's the planetarium. Oh, is there? All right. Okay. Moral of the story is he got away. We know he's alive and with sinks and that Naomi knows that too. And so does Vaz and they kind of keep it to themselves, which is nice. And then we kind of cut to Osman. Osman. Oh my So Osman decides with BB, she's going to open her file and kind of see who she is. And BB's super pleased at this. He's like, this isn't what you're going to expect. So she's really expecting like something terrible, almost like Naomi, where she has a family maybe or something horrible. Yeah, she's convinced herself that she didn't try to escape and she should have. And Yeah, she was trying to wonder why she didn't really care as much that uh, to get back and when she should. And she kind of almost views herself as kind of, was she a coward or what was her motivation, essentially? Her file kind of opens and it pretty much turns out that her... 
mother is a junkie slash prostitute and her father isn't really on the scene so it's unknown in terms of how that happened she was pretty much mistreated and never really looked she after she was eating food out of she was garbage. eating food out of the garbage and stuff like that she was very much a they survivor lured her and... with the burger like the only the only employee just lured her over with the burger and they didn't even bother to replace her no with a clone. they didn't even give her a clone because no one would care that's kind of hard, harsh. But obviously, her mother is. I don't think she's on file, or did they find her? Did she OD? I can't really remember. No, she's not on file of what happened to her. There's no on file anymore, so we don't know what happened to the mother. But what is on file is a teacher who immediately realized where Saren stopped coming to work, school, stopped coming to school. Sorry, and obviously pestered like authorities to look for her and find her. So Saren kind of decides. This is kind of worth investigating she wants to see. So she kind of schedules the team to have some of their R and R at on this planet where she's from. I can't remember. Do you have it in the notes there? There she is a Cascade. Cascade. So that's where they want to go. So they go to Cascade and the ODSTs Mal and Vaz go and get drunk and have a meal and stuff like that. And this is very much the guys coming becoming friends again based on the kind of interrogation scene and the information that got out and stuff like that and how the guys kind of feel about each other and in terms of like even how ODSTs normally do their R&Rs and they don't they're not behaving the same way so it's kind of showing the guys kind of changing and growing and even still being friends there is I don't think Naomi leaves does she I think she stays on the ship no she stays on the ship she doesn't want to go um same with Dev and Phyllis go and have dinner essentially and oh yeah they have a date they have a date and then Saren goes and sees this teacher who eventually kind of realizes who she is and they have kind of a lovely little kind of conversation. Well, she's like, what happened to you? And she's like, well, I got recruited into the UNSC and talks about how successful she is. And this teacher's just, this teacher's so heartwarming. Oh my gosh. It's so great that she has somebody like this in her life. She has like this whole conversation with her. It's just just like, maybe this is going to come to me eventually. And what unlocks all of her memories is she has this cake that the teacher makes and she suddenly has like this whole vivid memory of her like life as a child and this teacher feeding her you know after class taking and care stuff. of her yeah and then she realizes the reason why she never ran is because she had nowhere else to go and even later she tells naomi what what it was and they're like oh yeah john used to make fun of you because you ate so much for always stealing people's work uh, stealing people's food and stuff like that I, I like that a lot, too. I think Osmond has a really good backstory. It's not tragic, but it's tragic, kind of. Yeah. She she got a better life out of it. And that really helps kind of solidify her, and I like that. She has these characters that have these unknown origins now have, like, a solid base of which kind of to grow, which is kind of interesting where you get characters like this doing it, when you get our main character, John, not doing it. But you see his, I guess his growth is, his growth is kind of stunted, but we kind of see... Him and Cortana have different story arcs than these guys do. But it's it's still great to see. Speaking of unknown character arcs. Oh, Chris, you want to take it? Oh my god. No, I, if I take it, I'm going to get all choked up, but okay. Uh, <laughs> get choked up. Do it. This is the ep- this, this epilogue always makes me break down. I don't know why, but it's so oh, sad. Oh, no, it's awful. Oh, it's awful. It's so sad. So it's a... So it's like a transmission, it's not a transmission, it's like a letter. It's a letter to Perangoski, and it's, it's the a, science. It's a suicide age. note. It's a yeah, suicide it's a, it's, note, Krista. Yeah. It's a very casual suicide note, though. They're, they hint at, um, they seem to hint at there was like almost, he, she says that Baby's donor was far too young, he could have been one of her children, but there was definitely like an emotional interest between the two of them even with such an age gap you can tell they were like super close close, almost romantic even if she doesn't really completely admit to it yeah there's definitely something going on but this is just so nonchalant like it opens with one has to be careful with suicide notes it's just like well he's a he's very realistic about it because he's not like he's not committing suicide because he's he wants to die. It's Depressed. Just He's like... committing suicide because he doesn't think he'll get any justice otherwise. And to be fair, he's kind of right because Halsey never really gets her just desserts. But he has more of a moral compass than Halsey ever had. Oh, yeah. You're getting your head yourself here. Yeah, bit, so. so this is a... He, he explains that he's committing suicide because of his crimes against humanity. 
by participating in the Spartan 2 program. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he calls Co- Ca- Catherine Hard- Halsey lo- loathsome, which is great. Uh, he talks about his consciousness. He talks about his remorse. Uh, he talks about a lot of stuff, but he says, you know, no matter how intelligent I was, no matter how great of a thing we did, we did some appalling acts. And I'm never going to get justice for it. So I'm going to take my own life. He talks about the mortal dictata a lot. He says, I committed crimes against the mortal dictata. It says what it defends and stuff like that. It goes on. It goes on to just say, I am killing myself in a way that is not going to harm my brain so it can be retained for a an AI. He wants to donate his brain to the AI donor program. And specifically one that looks after Spartans. The Spartans he helped create. That's what his wants his AI to be. Yeah, he, he he says, Margaret, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I want to, this isn't, f- this isn't for me, this is for them. I want, I want my life to be for something, to help protect them and guide them and stuff like that. And it's just like, oh my god, what's going on? And then... At the very end of the epilogue, it says he went on to become the AI BB. Essentially, yeah. So this is the approval. It says, like, has a sign-off by Paranoski to approve this brain into the donor program. And BB, like, BB's only been commissioned recently. And I think Graham, uh, Graham commits suicide in 2532. Uh, let me see if there's a date on it. I have it. In there is it. I have it here in Helopedia. He commits suicide in twenty five thirty two, and this book takes place in twenty five fifty three. So she kept him on ice for almost two decades. Well, think about it. She's a she's about to die. She's picking a Spartan two to be her successor. What a better time to. Yeah. It shows you how far in advance she was planning these things. Yes, like she's kept him all this time knowing when she would use him and what she would use him for. And it just so happened another Spartan was on this team as well. Naomi and Osman, he gets to kind of watch over. Yeah. It's it's just like the nail in the coffin in this book that it's just like so emotional and so raw this entire time that... This epilogue that seemingly comes out of nowhere is like, oh my god, I can't handle this anymore. And it's it's because as well, like BB's such a like for the most part, such a nonchalant, chill character. He pretends he doesn't have a care in the world, even though he has a few. Like after his whole fragment thing, he becomes a little more like Graham than he realizes because he's blocked all this information out and doesn't want it. But there's a lot of times where it's it almost appears that bits of what Graham was is bleeding into BB. Oh, and totally. So, like, they hinted that through the book, and especially after he gets fragmented, you can kind of see some of it, where, like, they're kind of hinting at the fact that some of the donor obviously comes through. Yeah. And even if the AI is a unique being... It's still based off of the same brain. BB despises Halsey, and no one's ever... Qu- I think Osmond at one point says, how can you despise Halsey more than I do? And he's like, I don't know. And you see now why he hates Halsey so much. And then when he's with Staffan the whole time and he's been you know, this really respectful, sir, yes, sir, all the rest of it. And you're like, and apologetic. Yes, this isn't yeah, BB. Yeah. And then you're like, it's not BB, it's his donor. It's those feelings, yeah, imparted. So this is the second time I'm rereading this trilogy. And rereading it with this piece of information is, it completely changes your perspective on BB the entire time. It's it's really good. It's re- it's it's amazing to reread it knowing this. It's so cool. And then our story's over. The trilogy's over. So good. I love the raw emotions and the characters in this. Karen Travis did an amazing job just kind of creating something super emotional in a universe that usually isn't. Yeah. I think she always does a very good job with characters and she does a very good job with Funnily enough, she does a very good job with like parent issues because it's the same thing in the Gears of War books. They're all basically Marcus Phoenix daddy issues the entire time. And then these books are different sort of... uh... Daddy issues. So she does a very good job with all that and building people. And I know not everyone's a fan of these books because they they very much have the fuck Halsey theme, but I think they do a fantastic job of pointing out why people should be like fuck Halsey because... 
while yeah. she may be a really likable character and we kind of like have this I think sometimes we have like the bungee sheen of everything was for the greater good. This book does a really good job of pointing out it's like you shouldn't like Halsey. She's an absolute monster. And the fact yeah. that you do like her is probably like a credit to how they've developed her character. But she's a terrible person and everything well, she did is atrocious. In a lot of the times we see Halsey through the eyes of a Spartan, like Master Chief. And I think that's why we have so much love and devotion for Halsey, because her her first introduction was in Fall of Reach, where it was mostly John's opinion of her. True. It's either, I think we either see Halsey through them, or we see Halsey through Halsey. Yeah. Or Jake, Jacob Keyes as well as a bit of Keyes. Yeah. But like Keyes, Keyes figured her out pretty quickly. He still loved her. He still loved her, but he knew she wasn't a great person. And Miranda was the same Oh, Miranda didn't like Halsey and, at And, like, all. we know Cortana, like, really kind of has a, like, I think Cortana kind of has an inbuilt hatred of her, but I think that's Halsey's... Way more than you realise until you get, like, into Halo 5 and 4 and stuff. If we're going by, like, the donor stuff, I think that's Halsey's own self-loathing that she doesn't realise she has. Because, yeah. like, she knows she's a horrible person, but she also is able to, like, disassociate herself from it. <laughs> and Master Chief's, like, yeah. the awkward middleman where he's like, I love both of you. He's like, I love my evil scientist mommy and I love my computer mommy girlfriend. My evil scientist <laughs> computer. Yeah. Awesome. That's so good. Oh, my goodness. But definitely, I agree with uh, Krista. This makes me, that that whole final bit, everything about this, very emotional. I personally am a big fan of these books. I like the fact that the only other time it's sh- anything has shone like a less than flattering light on the Spartan 2 program is Hunt the Truth. Yes, which does that very well. Yes, and that in this book, I think this book shows you what the parents went through and hunt the truth like was the first time i thought about the clones properly and went like yeah big oh, time. this is awful i like this because everything else is very rah rah we're saving the day whereas halo 4 and this like the start of halo 4 when it touches on when the guys interrogate and halsey is like like you're twisting the facts to suit your own agenda like you you built these spartans to crush humans not to fight aliens and do the glorious battles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She kidnapped these kids to get them to crush rebellions, basically, and people that wanted to be free. Like, that's that's their only real crime. At the oh, end. and she completely twists history. Like, even during the book, Stefan is like, Stefan's putting two and two together. He's like, we didn't even know about the Covenant until... Oh, yeah, this he, he this. does say and that, he's doesn't he? He's like, yeah, did, yeah, did the funny. UNSC just not tell us? Or... And, I think Naomi's like, It's Osmond, and Osmond's like, uh... (laughs) Afraid not. Yeah, she's she's like, no, they were meant... Well, I think it was Naomi, because she was like, no, we we were meant for the insurrection. He's like, have you killed humans? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, I killed a few. So nonchalant about it. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. She's very, yeah, yeah, I did that. (laughs) And it also points out, it kind of glosses over, but it it does mention the kind of other horror that really kind of tips Stefan over the edge is that it removes their ability to have kids or at least their their need, their want to do so. He is very adamant about her having a family and settling down and stuff like that. He just doesn't get it. Yeah, and when she mentions that it's not even something she kind of wants or may not even be able to have. Because she kind of, like, she has the closest she has to her relationship with Vaz, but it's never going to be... Normal. A loving, like, romantic relationship. They kind of have, like, a respect for each other. I think it might be. I think that could be one they could do it. I mean, they could make it kind of like Fred and, uh... God, what's her name? Lopez. Lopez, yeah. Feta. Just kind of the, the thing that's going on between him and her. It could be something similar. It's like a very platonic love yes, relationship. Yes, it kind of is. Like, there's... Grandel's the only one so far that's, like, gone far enough with anything to make babies but i can't see yeah they don't make maternity armor do they (laughs) no it's just a big belly spartans are almost asexual in nature though i mean they just don't they they have no want spartan twos are spartan threes definitely fuck oh yeah like bunnies (laughs) there's our audio quote for this week's episode like bunnies and a great place to end overall 
this trilogy is amazing. This book is incredible. The feels in this book are unbelievable. The topics it covers. This is probably only the second book I've actually cried. Halo book that I've actually like, I, cr- I cry during it and I know I'm going to. And it just happens. Yeah, it's one that's definitely made me the most uncomfortable. And has definitely put me in places where I need to reconsider characters I love based on the mo- like Halsey and stuff based on like the real effects of her actions. It really calls you out and says, you know, it really makes you think about how you've been thinking about the Halo universe. Yeah, it makes you like realize you shouldn't you shouldn't like Halsey the way you do. And yeah. there's good reason for it. I think like it doesn't you can still like Halsey, and I still like Halsey, but it li- I love like, Halsey. It wasn't until this book where I stopped and thought, Halsey has a lot to answer for, and a lot of it's kind of awful. It's sort of like The Librarian. I think yeah. you get that with the Forerunner books, because The Librarian's this great... She's like the saviour of humanity, and she does a lot of great things, but along the way, you're like, you did a lot of fucked up shit. And granted, she did it for better intentions than Halsey, I think. They also do a somewhat better job in this book of pointing out the fact that Halsey didn't work alone, that it took hundreds if not thousands of people in the know yes. to pull off the Spartan 2 program so they do a good job of that as Karen well. Karen very aware of that she touches on it a lot Like she definitely feels it more now and, and she's made comments on the fact well she left, lost a friend to it yeah, any, any last points guys? Amazing, read it Nothing we can say in this podcast will do it the justice it deserves by you sitting down and actually reading the book. Get to it, guys. Aaron, any last words? Uh, no. Like I said, overall, this and the Forerunner books are my two favourite sets of Halo novels, and don't know if I could pick a favourite because they're both very awesome for different reasons, but I think if you enjoyed this and you like this, do yourself a favour. Go and pick up the Gears of War books and give them a <laughs> read because you will be amazed at how much character depth Catherine or Catherine Halsey, how much character <laughs> depth depth Karen Travis puts into a book about steroid soldiers chainsawing people. <laughs> Stop promoting other franchises, Aaron. Go read Halo books, everybody. Don't read. Only read Halo books. Get rid of all your other books. Oh, although don't read the Gears books if you have daddy issues because it will leave you very traumatized. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks Aaron. for traumatizing people. Just giving giving a fair warning. <laughs> Okay, guys, that's pretty much it for Podcast Evolved Book Club this month. It's actually a pretty long one. Jesus we did all, we, we did well. I did a lot of talking. My voice is sore now. Hopefully, you guys are happy with how we covered the books, that we hit on the main topics. I think we did a pretty good job, even if I did get myself muddled with the other with the other books. But uh, they all blend into one when you get to some stage. It does. Please go check out our amazing website, halopodcastevolved.com. We are also halopodcast.com for some crazy reason. Um, we have that... Go check out our store. We really appreciate any kind of merch and monies you can throw our way via our Patreon page, which is, you know, Patreon and Halo Podcast Evolved. What else have we got? That's pretty much it. So I just want to say thank you all again and Evolved. 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 Welcome Spartans to the latest Podcast Evolved Book Club. I'm your host today, David, and joined with me is Oren. No, not Oren, so let's scrap that and start again. <laughs> Don't know why I said Oren. Oren doesn't read. I know, that's probably why he's on my brain. Okay, sorry. Welcome Spartans to the latest Podcast Evolved Book Club. I'm your host today, David, and with me is Oren. Oh my god. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> why did I do that again? <laughs> I'm going to write it out. Hang on a second. I get that out of my system. I'm going to write the names out so I don't fuck it up. Was it in the script or something? No, he wasn't in the, There were no names in the script. He's just broken today. Yeah, I don't know what's wrong with me. Okay, I'm going to do it properly now. If I fuck it up this time, Krista, you're taking the lead. Okay.